assalamu alaikum everybody uh, our very next session is about uh, perilous intimacies debating hindu muslim friendship after empire with me i have shared ali tareen from franklin and marshall college usa with alia nakwi iba karachi thank you thank you assalamu alaikum thank you for coming to this session we have all just emerged from another session with dr shair ali tareen uh if you were not there um he is the author of two recent books very prolific the one we were discussing an hour ago was defending muhammad in modernity and the one we are going to discuss in this session is perilous Hin intimacies hindu muslim friendship um after empire and by empire of course he means islamic empire Dr Tareen teaches at Franklin and Marshall University and he did his PhD in religious studies from Duke. His research interests if you look at both books um are centered in colonial or and early modern South Asia uh with a focus on intra muslim debates yani ke aapas mein kya behas aur guftugu chal rahi thi amongst different kinds of muslims beyond that both books are different and stand alone this one um looks at 19th and 20th, 20th century muslim debates around what the muslim community's relationship with the south asian hindu community should be but i will let dr tareen explain uh, more about what he's trying to do in this book assalamu alaikum thank you uh, so much alia um well i uh, want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me here and for uh, holding uh, this uh, panel i really want to thank all of you for your time and i really want to thank uh, uh, professor alia for taking out the time to both engage the book on rather short notice um and uh, to be here i really really am um uh, uh, um uh, very uh, uh glad and thankful for her presence uh, in this panel uh, especially since this is being recorded i just want to very briefly register the unprecedented moment in which we are living and just begin with the prayer for peace and justice for the people of palestine um so uh, maybe for a few uh, minutes i'll just briefly try to introduce uh, this book and its uh, key arguments maybe a good way to begin with this book is to explain a bit the title of the book which is perilous intimacies what am i getting at with that this book primarily is on intra muslim scholarly debates centered on hindu muslim friendship and interreligious friendship more broadly my interest in this topic really comes about uh with a view to the ways in which this idea of friendship has been talked about both in western philosophical uh, thought and also in islamic intellectual history in regards to western philosophical reflections on friendship which are very extensive but one of the interesting threads that you find there is that from aristotle onwards there is an emphasis on what one might call the 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 double face of friendship in that a friend is someone uh who really enriches and nourishes one's life uh if it is a good friend but if someone is blindingly bound with a harmful friend that can also be the cause of uh, uh harm destruction or even erasure uh so alexander nehemas this philosopher in his very magisterial intellectual survey of the idea of friendship talks about this idea of the the the, the double face of uh, friendship and even in the thought of someone like jacques derrida uh, in the politics of friendship as well and but even more so perhaps in this cryptically titled article of his called hospitality he sketches the troubling common origin between the ideas of hostility and hospitality and talks about friendship as something which can only exist alongside the wound of enmity so i am interested in looking about looking at friendship as something which holds a promise but also a peril this idea of the promise and peril of friendship now if you look at the islamic intellectual tradition which is also very diverse and uh, and very rich on this notion of friendship with many different categories that one can use for this uh, cat, uh, for this idea but though my book is so focused on early modern and modern south asia 
the Muslim discursive category corresponding with the idea of friendship uh, that I'm most interested in is this category called Muwalat, M-U-W-A-L-A-T, uh, which is an idea that comes from the Arabic roots Waliya, from which we also get terms like Wali or Awliya or friends of God, Sufi saints, etc. And from that we also get uh, categories like Wilaya or Walaya, which can mean sainthood or dominion, etc. The interesting thing about this category of Muwalat or Wilaya, Walaya in Muslim intellectual thought is that on the one hand, the wali or so someone with whom you're in a relationship of muwalat could be friendship or closeness, proximity. But on the other hand, this term can also mean having power over someone else or a sovereign power over the other. So, you know, God himself, for example, describes himself in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah in the Quran as the guardian of the faithful, uh, uh, the wali of the faithful. So this kind of a dual etymology of this idea of friendship as meaning both closeness, uh, proximity, but also power, sovereignty, etc. What I am interested in this book is the tension and the friction between the ideas of friendship and sovereignty. With the idea being that friendship as a relationship that binds you to the contingencies of the other and entangles you to the contingencies of the other, friendship is by its nature an announcement of the absence of sovereignty over the self. So when someone has been bound and entangled with the contingencies of the other, that by itself reflects the absence of the sovereign mastery over the self. So how is this um, tension and this friction between the ideas of sovereignty and friendship how is this negotiated in a political context of early modern and modern South Asia marked by the absence of political sovereignty? So basically the main conceptual theme of the book is to explore ways in which intra-Muslim discourses and debates on Hindu-Muslim friendship becomes the arena for intra-Muslim negotiations about the nature place and limits of Islam in the modern world, marked by the absence of Muslim political sovereignty. Um, and that in some ways is the main conceptual theme and my uh, sort of three main arguments that I pursue in this book, very briefly. Number one, that in these intra-Muslim debates on Hindu-Muslim friendship, regardless of what kind of position individual Muslim scholars took, and I'll give you a couple of examples as we get into the discussion, that regardless of what kind of position they held, whether they were more permissive, more hospitable to the prospect of Hindu-Muslim friendship, or uh, uh, they were uh, less permissive or more uh, um, hostile, these competing positions rested on competing visions of Muslim sovereign power. So although these debates happen in a context of the loss of Muslim political sovereignty, but paradoxically, at work and stake in these intra-Muslim debates precisely were competing notions of Muslim sovereign power in a world defined by the absence of Muslim political sovereignty. So that's point number one. The second point that I try to make in this book is that these intra-Muslim debates cannot be collapsed onto uh, binaries like inclusive, exclusive, hospitable, hostile, etc. But there's something more complicated happening there. And the third main argument, as I spoke uh, just now, is that these uh, uh, debates are reflective of intra-Muslim debates. The debates on inter-religious friendship are in fact reflective of intra-Muslim debates on the place and limits of Islam in the modern world. So the six chapters of this book deal with themes such as Muslim scholarly translations of Hinduism, um, uh, Hindu-Muslim doctrinal polemics, uh, looking at the polemics between the founder of the Arya Samaj, Pandit Dayananda Saraswati, and the founder of uh, the Deoband Madrasa, Marana Muhammad Qasim Nanothwi in 1870s. Then there are two chapters on the Khilafat movement and looking at how this triangular, triangular relationship between the British, the Hindus, and the Muslims was debated by different groups of Muslim scholars. And the last two chapters are on the doctrine and idea of what is called tashabbu in Islam, which means reprehensible imitation of the non-Muslim, which comes from the famous hadith of the Prophet, man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum, whoever imitates a people becomes one of them. So uh, these last two chapters do both a survey of 
different views on this question, looking at both Muslim uh, uh, ulama scholars uh, and also looking at Nazir Ahmad Dhelvi and his novella called Ibn al -Waqt. And in the very final chapter, I look at the Shabbo as an example of a debate between Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the founder of Aligarh, and uh, uh, Maulana Qari Tayyib, who was the grandson of the founder of Deoband, uh, uh, Qasim Nanotwi. So how does the Shabbo become the grounds for the competing understandings of modernism and traditionalism in South Asian Islam. The last thing that I would say, and there I'll close and hand it over to Alia, is that one of the key motifs of this book, uh, which is what makes this book quite different from the first book, uh, for those of you who might have been on the earlier panel, is that in this book, I am much more explicitly interested in the question of how, on the one hand, Muslim traditionalist actors, or the ulama, engage with a pre-modern, Muslim intellectual and legal tradition when the very political context of that tradition, which was one of Muslim imperial sovereignty, when the very political context of, the, of that tradition was no longer there, how did they then uh, draw on and mobilize the resources of that tradition? So the question of how does a community um, engage with a tradition when the very political context of that tradition is no longer available? So that's much more explicitly a focus of this book than the last one. And the second way in which this book is very different, other than the fact that it has completely new actors and different set of actors and texts, um, is that in this book, I'm much more explicitly interested in the question of how the question of Hindu-Muslim friendship becomes the grounds for the fault lines between Muslim modernism and traditionalism in South Asia, and becomes the fault lines for these divisions between scholars such as Abdul Kalam Azad, Sayyid Ahmed Khan, and a certain genealogy of Muslim modernism and then other Muslim traditionalist scholars. So it takes into account a variety of different scholars, including the Sufi master Mirza Mazar Jane Janan, uh, as I said, Maulana Muhammad Qasim Nanotri of the Deoband School, Abul Kalam Azad, Ahmad Raza Khan, Maulvi Abdul Bari of the Farangi Mahal School, and then a range of other scholars uh, as well. So I'll just keep... Achha. So, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll pause there and, and, and hand it over to Ali. Thank you, Sherili. Mere pehle sawal ka jawab to aapne de diya because I was going to ask him to talk about this governing concept of friendship, uh, what you mean by it. And uh, maybe you can talk more about Mawalla and uh, where it comes from as a term and how the concept grew through the tradition. Um, but then there is this other concept that you work with that the entire uh, Islamic intellectual tradition emerges and develops in a context, right, a historical context in which uh, Muslim political sovereignty is not in question. And that cannot be divorced from the ideas. So what happens when Muslim political sovereignty is no longer there? It is, there's only, there's one other moment in history where that happened, which is after the Mongol invasions, uh, where a non-Muslim power completely decimated uh, the known Islamic world, ended the Abbasid Caliphate, and took over Darul Islam. Uh, there is actually a very short but interesting, um, you know, uh, bit of scholarship in the Hanafi legal tradition at that time, trying to uh, figure out that agar, um, Agar Islami Hakimiyat Khatam Ogaye or Abka Hakim Rair Muslim hai, to are you living in Darul Harb or Darul Islam? And these are concepts that are very much explored in your book and are important to your actors. And they are thinking about this, right? In British colonial India. Ke, ab hum Darul Islam mein hai ya Darul Harb mein hai? So maybe you can ex talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Abhi um, Tikai? पहले बहुत खराब था कि ठीक था अच्छा अच्छा फिर से तो ना बोलूं कुछ ठीक है अच्छा सो सो कपल ऑफ थिंग्स या ऑन मोवाला द ओनली थिंग दैट आई वुड ऐड इज दैट दिस कांसेप्ट कैन हैव दिस दिस डुअल मीनिंग ऑफ फ्रेंडशिप बट आल्सो अ रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन द स्टेट एंड इट्स सब्जेक्ट्स सो इट कैन टेक दिस काइंड ऑफ अ डुअल मीनिंग एज़ वेल ऑन दिस आईडिया ऑफ अ मुस्लिम इंपीरियल political theology, uh, an imperial Muslim political theology as I call it. One thing that I, 
taking the opportunity from your excellent question and observations, Alia, is that, you know, when you take a concept like sovereignty in Western philosophical thought and try to map it onto a different kind of an archive coming from Muslim intellectual resources and tradition, uh, a couple of things to uh, uh, make note of. One is that this category of sovereignty, of course, has a very long history and set of contestations that happen even within Western philosophical thought and in Christian theology and thought as well. So, you know, for someone like Thomas Aquinas, of course, this idea of sovereignty meant the, the fullness of God's reason, which then is taken by the nominalists and who give, this, give it a different kind of meaning of God is that sovereign who can announce the exception, who can make the exception, which eventually, of course, humans also take by uh, uh, making exception uh, centerpiece of sovereignty, which, of course, is then meditated on by someone like Carl Schmitt and so on. Um, so this category of sovereignty, I should clarify, does not correspond to any one particular category in Arabic, Persian, or Urdu. But it's a family of different concepts ranging from uh, something like, of course, an encompassing category like Tawheed, but also uh, uh, something like Rob or Heba, uh, uh, or uh, Khilafa, why Sejerency, uh, iktidar and so on. So all these different family of concepts that are used by these actors I look at at different points and in different texts that come together to index a desire for maintaining Muslim dominance and superiority over the other. And this desire is very foundational to the Sharia, the Muslim legal tradition. One of uh, the most important traditions, not the only tradition, but one of the most important traditions in Islam. And this, of course, is expressed in a variety of different ways from things like, you know, prophetic statements like Islam is exalted and nothing is exalted over it. Al-Islam ya'lu wa la ya'la and other uh, of these kinds of statements. And I look at a number of pre-modern examples in the introduction as well. Now, the point I want to clarify is that clearly the logic of Muslim imperial sovereignty in the pre-modern period is not a monolith whatsoever. There are different logics of caliphal sovereignty, political sovereignty. And the other thing to clarify is that while there is this kind of an ideal that the Sharia will reflect the desired goal of maintaining Muslim dominance and superiority over the other, but on the ground, of course, uh, the relationship between this scripted ideal and what happened in terms of intercommunal relations on the ground would always, of course, be uh, not one that can be seemingly mapped onto each other, which is the case with any tradition, with any pre-modern or modern tradition. So I'm, my objective is not to uh, posit some kind of a uh, pre-modern monolith when it comes to uh, positing this category of an imperial Muslim political theology. And the other thing to clarify, of course, is that by talking about any Muslim imperial political theology, I don't mean to impute onto the pre-modern Muslim intellectual tradition the liberal sin, sin of toler intolerance, because that would be a very an anachronistic move, and that would also erase the much more uh, uh, exclusionary politics of the modern state. But what I am interest interested in is the question that key Muslim jurisprudential categories that you mentioned, Darul Islam, Darul Harb, or how you talk about non-Muslims as dhimmi, those who are protected under a Muslim rule, or uh, 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 kufare, uh, kufare muharib, those who are active aggressors who are non-Muslims. These very categories, these very uh, way in which the organizing logic of Muslim jurisprudential tra uh, tradition is, 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 is structured, is informed by a political context of Muslim empire. Um, is informed that the grammar of the of these concepts is indebted to the political condition and context of Muslim empire, um, which was taken for granted. It was not something that was deliberately thought about by the jurists. It was just part of the, the, the grammar of law that it was connected to Muslim empire. Now, when that very political context is no longer there, what kind of a negotiation do we find in the early modern and modern period between the the, uh, the resources and the legacy of this pre-modern legal tradition on the question of Muslim, non-Muslim relations, and then the reality and the conditions, expectations, and pressures of, and categories of, most importantly, perhaps, colonial modernity. So one of the key ideas of the book is to look at the encounter and the interface between these two things. The expectations, categories, and conditions of colonial modernity, and the resources and legacies of the pre-modern Muslim jurisprudential tradition. And how that encounter and interface then becomes a site in which and through which very creative but also ambiguous 
and uh, fascinating but also contradictory often um, responses to the whole question of what are the normative limits of Hindu-Muslim friendship are articulated, debated, and contested. So I'll pause there and maybe get to the specifics of the next. I think I'm going to invite you to tell the wonderful story that I heard you uh, uh, telling in your talk in Karachi. Your chapters uh, three and four focus on that. Abhi inhone baat ki is, I love triangle to nahi but this triangle of friendship and enmity, right, between the British, the Muslims, and the Hindus. Uh, so, so in certain contexts, uh, for instance, in the cause of the Khilafat movement, the Muslims feel they need to politically ally with the Hindu community to present a common cause to the British colonial government and the world. In other respects, right, um, the, the uh, very detailed and um, granular analysis you do of the debates around cow slaughter and beef eating at the same time, right? So, the ulama who are like Abdul Bari, they are saying that the most important thing is that there is a conflict. There is a sort of a global sovereign head. Rahe. And if in that cause we have to abstain out of, uh, from eating beef or cow slaughter in order to befriend our Hindu neighbors and make common cause for them, then that's the important thing. That's what we have to do. In response or against him is people like Ahmad Raza Khan who are saying, no, this public ritual act makes us who we are. If we are giving in to the colonial state and the Hindu majority by uh, somehow being coerced into not acting out our public Muslimness by slaughtering animals and eating beef, then our very identity and being as Muslims is affected. So, and, and the interesting point that you made and, 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 and it make in the book with ample evidence is that these two moments which are and are in, in, um, in hostile competition or rivalry with each other are still rooted in uh, the same theological, philosophical, and legal tradition. So if you could maybe get into some of the specifics of this story, I think it would really bring out what you're trying to do. Thank you for such a close reading of those chapters. Uh, I'm really um, indebted to you for that. Um, so, one of the things that I've been quite interested in for some time is the degree to which there is an intensification of investment in Muslim everyday ritual life in Muslim intellectual traditions in the 19th century. I mean, what is it about that moment that makes the everyday and makes Muslim ritual life so critical for different uh, scholars. Um, but let me come to the Khilafat movement and I will connect this point uh, to that in a moment. So this is a debate that, of course, I don't need to say that for this audience, but since it's been recorded, um, which takes place almost exactly a century ago in 1919 and 1920 in the context of Khilafat movement, which was trying to pressure the British colonial government into restoring the territorial and uh, uh, symbolic uh, 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 status uh, and boundaries of the Ottoman Caliphate. And that led to this very interesting debate because Abul Kalam Azad argued, uh, this, this famous Muslim scholar who became the Education Minister of Independent India as well, Muslim modernist scholar, though very much grounded and steeped in Muslim ulama traditions as well. Um, so he basically made the argument that um, in the conditions that exist in 1920, because the British government has attacked the foundational fulcrum of Muslim political and devotional life, the caliphate, and Abul Kalam Azad argued in this text that I do a very detailed reading of uh, in chapter 3, uh, which is called Jaziratul Arab. It is also known with the title Mas'ala Khilafat, a really fascinating text. He makes the argument that in the absence of the caliphate, even Muslim obligatory practices like praying, fasting have no value because the caliphate is basically the roots, and from that come these branches of Muslim practices. Uh, so since the British state has attacked the foundational roots of Muslim devotional and political life, we must ally with the Hindus and especially with Gandhi and the Indian National Congress to forge a united front with which we can confront 
the British state. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when Abul Kalam Azad is looked back upon in the present moment, the tendency tends to be that he was a great pluralist or this inclusivist who talked about Hindu-Muslim alliance and friendship. But the interesting thing is that in making his argument, Abul Kalam Azad, the sources of knowledge that he mobilizes are squarely from the Muslim normative tradition and from the Sharia and primarily from the Quran. He draws on these two verses from chapter 60 of the Quran called The Woman Examined, Surah Mumtahana. And these two verses, I'm paraphrasing them, basically says that it is fine for you to turn in friendship towards those unbelievers who don't fight you in religion, who don't throw you out of your homes, who are basically not aggressive towards you. And you only uh, are forbidden to turn in friendship towards those unbelievers who do these things, fight against you, throw you out of your homes or aid others in uh, driving you forth. Now the key uh, sentence there is those who don't fight you in religion. Lam yuqatilukum fi deen. So Azad argued that from these two verses the Hindus are this community that don't fight in religion and the British is the community that does so because they're attacking the caliphate. So this led to a massive debate among Muslim scholars about this triangular relationship that I talked about. Uh, the interesting thing with Abul Kalam Azad is, in addition to the fact that he also argued that launching jihad or a holy war against the British is an individual obligation for all Muslims. It's a uh, fardul ayn or a, a farz ayn. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that Abul Kalam Azad, while arguing for Hindu-Muslim friendship, is basically articulating a certain vision of Muslim sovereign power invested in the institution of the caliphate in a world which is defined by the absence of Muslim political sovereignty otherwise. And one of the most interesting things about the Khilafat movement is that the scholars and uh, leaders associated with it, including Azad, they never argued that Muslims should become subjects of the Ottoman Caliphate, of the Ottoman Empire. So they were very clear that we don't want to be subjects of them, but we want to restore and we want to preserve its territorial and symbolic integrity. So that's an interesting way to look at it. So that's one vision of Muslim sovereign power. Now, on the other hand, a scholar like Ahmad Raza Khan, the founder of the Barelvi school, and again, you know, the, the, one of the stereotypes about the Barelvi school is that it's the more, the, the more soft or the more populist and so on. But Ahmad Raza Khan was anything but these things. And he basically counter-argued that if you argue for Hindu-Muslim intimacy in the public sphere, um, that will lead to the erasure and the, 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 the diminishing first and eventually the erasure of this very key category which is central to the book as well, the erasure of markers of Muslim public distinction or markers of distinction in the public sphere or those rituals that make possible markers of uh, Muslim distinction, what is known as uh, shi'ar -e islam plural shi'ar -e islam so for Maulana Ahmad Raza Khan, on the one hand, he argued that this phrase, Lam yukatilukum fiddin, in the Quran, uh, the, the, the Azad's argument that it's not applicable to Hindus is not correct. He said, go to any town, any village, and try sacrificing a cow and see what will happen to you. So they certainly are in uh, the category of people who have committed you know, uh, aggression towards you. But secondly, and more importantly, and more substantive for, uh, substantively for me, his argument was that it is precisely in these markers of Muslim distinction, like cow sacrifice, that Muslim sovereign power was now located. That the imperial fantasy of maintaining dominance and power over the other was now to be located and enshrined. The thing that I find interesting in this vision of Muslim sovereign power is that, um, which is the, the backdrop of which is the loss of Muslim political sovereignty, that it is a notion of sovereign power which is not territorial nor bound to the institution of the state, but rather it is bound to the choreography of everyday life um, in a manner which would establish Muslim sovereign power over the other. I think I'll pause now and maybe we can get into the cow if you wish. Or maybe, later. maybe later if somebody brings it up. Uh, then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, mo moving a little bit further away uh, from the, the details of the book. Uh, in terms of the scholarly discursive tradition that you are engaging with uh, in South Asian historiography, uh, there is this ongoing debate about whether British colonial rule constitutes a rupture or continuity with the pre-colonial past. Obviously it is clear by now and very much so in your work that both things are happening. Uh, could you comment a little bit on how both things are happening? 
Uh, before I come to your question, I just want to add one thing to the last question, uh, uh, specifically because we're in Lahore and to really bring home the, the relevance of this debate happening a century earlier to this moment, that this debate really sparks off because Abul Kalam Azad writes a fatwa, a legal opinion, saying that Muslim institutions and colleges should not take any funding from the British, which leads a professor from Islamia College, Lahore, to write a letter to Ahmad Raza Khan, what should we do here? And Ahmad Raza Khan makes this very interesting move to say that um, in regards to the relationship that Muslims should have with the British, who are also non-Muslim, what should we do in that context? He makes an interesting distinction between what he calls masked friendship, what he calls mawalat suwariya masked friendship, and substantive friendship, mawalat hakikiya And he also says that with the British, you have to maintain and continue mere transactional relations. The term there is mujarrade mu'amalat, mere transactional relations meaning taking funding and so on, because his great fear was that uh, by completely uh, severing all ties with the British, which is what Azad and Khilafat movement was arguing, in the category there is tarke mawalat, severing all civic ties, that will only lead to the economic and political destruction of the Muslim community. That to him was a, a ploy or a scheme of Gandhi uh, to basically elevate uh, the Hindu community and diminish uh, the Muslim community. So it's a very interesting, the topography that we are in right now, this is precisely where these debates came from. And there are some present relevances as well. The epilogue of the books ends with contemporary Pakistan and contemporary India. But coming more specifically to your question, and then I'll open, we should open it up for other people, so I'll be very brief. So I'll give you one example of continuities, but also disjunctions. Uh, how, 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 how might we see that? So the example I want to bring uh, or talk about is from chapter two of the book, which is perhaps the most entertaining chapter of the book and also one that I really enjoyed writing as well, which is on an interreligious polemical festival that took place in 1876 and 1877 that included Christian missionaries, uh, Pandit Dayananda Saraswati of the Arya Samaj and the founder of Deoband, Maulana Muhammad Qasim Nanothwi. It was a polemical festival organized by the British state in collaboration with a local uh, Hindu landowner in the district of Shah Jahanpur in northern India. Happened for two years, four days each where these people went there, they basically debated things from authenticity of scripture to miracles to life after death, etc., etc., for four days with people surrounded uh, and, the, and the British state uh, uh, arranged for food and police and chairs and so on. And then basically each side has its own historiography. So I looked at both the Muslim historiography and to some extent uh, the historiography of the Arya Samaj. So one of the questions that comes up in this debate is whose miracles are most miraculous? And this was basically debated uh, between uh, Dananda Saraswati and Qasim Nanothwi. So Qasim Nanothwi, among other miracles, talked about the miracle of splitting the moon in half, what is called Shakul Qamar uh, in the Quran, in the Muslim tradition. And the basis of why he said this is the most uh, miraculous miracle is because he said it is the most scientifically improbable miracle. Uh, and then Dananda Saraswati uh, raised the objection that if your miracle is so miraculous and so great, how is it that it has not been recorded in, quote unquote, world histories? So that leads Qasim Nanothwi to respond that, you know, the reason why it was not recorded is because the time when the moon split in half, it was approaching midnight in Western countries, people did not see it, so on and so forth. So to come to your question of continuities and disjunctures. The continuities here are that the very tradition of interreligious polemics, talking about miracles, it has a much longer uh, history in Muslim intellectual tradition, the whole Munazara genre, of course, has a much longer history in which this uh, figure, Qasim Nanothwi, really the, uh, the, the, uh, the paradigmatic traditionalist of South Asian Islam, clearly was very much grounded in the tradition, in the tradition of dialectical theology, ilmul kalam in Islam. So very much grounded in a continuous tradition. But what was new, the disjuncture, three things. One, here you have an interreligious polemic which is not being fought out in some kind of an imperial court in the Abbasid era or later, but it is being fought out in the most public of all spheres, a tract of barren land in Shah Jahanpur district in which the public is actually assembled to then give its assent to whichever side it finds more, most convincing. So this notion of a public which is out there to be reformed, to be, uh, to be doctrinally persuaded is something decisively new. The second new thing of course here is the whole idea that you prove that your miracle is most miraculous by showing its scientific improbability. So this whole language of modern science and its uh, status as the arbiter of what is true. And the last thing that I would mention here is this whole idea of historicism. That the way that you establish the authenticity and superiority of your tradition is by showing its groundedness 
in world histories. This would have been unthinkable a few centuries ago that it is by inclusion in world histories and your historicist prowess that will establish the authenticity of your tradition. So here we find continuities but also disjunctures in terms of how the new conditions, categories uh, and uh, expectations of colonial modernity encounters a much longer Muslim intellectual tradition of the Munazara or the polemic genre. Thank you. That was a great example. Um, we'll open it up to the audience now. Is there a mic? Thank you so much for this. Um, I really enjoyed it, listening to you, and I look forward to reading the book. Um, so the question I'm going to ask is based more on the articles that you've written, but also the sense that I get from your talk. Um, that the way that I read it is that when you're talking about friendships, you're talking about friendships between communities, so the Hindu community and the Muslim community at a particular juncture in colonial British India. And I wonder whether any of these debates about how to behave between communities um, trickle down to the household or the individual level, particularly keeping in mind this idea that you have about that it's, there is peril, right? Like a good friend could be great or a bad friend could be really bad for you and whether this trickles into um, relationships and friendships at the household or individual level. Thank you for that. That was very interesting. And I have a question about friendship as well, which is really that I get a, um, I get a sense of what you mean by sovereignty, which is fascinating. But from your account, I haven't read the book. I look forward to reading it. I don't really get a sense of what friendship means here so much because um, you start off with data and there I think friendship is more of a concept to think about the architecture of equality or reciprocity, mutuality. And here it seems that it is more transactional, more guarded, more measured to begin with. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could give me a little bit of an account of friendship in your work. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Amara, to, for that great question. Well, there are a couple of things that I would say in response to that. Clearly, there are anxieties precisely about the level of the household, the level of the public sphere that is animating the interest of these scholars. Um, and you clearly see that, especially in, this, in the highly gendered ways in which uh, these scholars are talking about, for example, the participation of Muslim women in, in, in rituals like Diwali, Holi, etc., and, and the whole sort of way in which that body is much more vulnerable to be parasitized by, by the other. So clearly there is some kind of a, uh, anxiety at work about regulating uh, the contours of these relationships at the level of the household. Um, now, clearly, because you know of my training, my primary focus is on these Muslim intellectual traditions and texts. Um, but I, I think your question really um, talks about an absence in this book, uh, uh, which is precisely how this was unfolding at the level of the household, at the level of the everyday. Uh, which would, of course, require the analytical tools of anthropology uh, uh, and uh, uh, but, but what I can confirm, even from my sources, is very clearly, the interesting thing, for example, is when it comes to Muslim scholarly translations of Hinduism, which is what chapter one focuses on, looking specifically at this 18th century Sufi figure called Mirza Mazar Jane Janan. And this is something that you found actually, find even before that, in Muslim scholarly translations of Hindu thought, practice, etc. This distinction that they always make between Hindu scholastic traditions and its evaluation, primarily Brahmins and their texts and so on, and then the Hindus on the ground, the masses, etc. And even among the most generous and the most charitable of Muslim scholars looking at Hinduism, like the figure I look at, they always make this distinction and always have a much um, uh, uh, less opinion, a much lesser opinion of uh, the non-scholarly traditions and the intermingling on that level. So what I can confirm is clearly there are things happening at the level of the household that is animating the interests and anxieties of these actors. Now, what is that is something that is, is a lack of this book because of my disciplinary training. Um, thank you so much for that question. You know, what I will do in response to your question is, I'll actually just read a sentence because... Uh, uh, so, I, 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 so basically, the way I understand friendship, this is on page four, is a relationship or encounter of intimacy, collaboration, cooperation or hospitality with the other that while affording particular benefits, opportunities and forms of power and pleasure also renders untenable 
exclusive claims to the purity and sovereign ownership of the self. So in this case, one of the main things that I am interested in is precisely that idea of the promise and the peril. Uh, friendship as a relationship which, which soils and which makes impossible claims to the sovereign mastery of the self because you are entangled with the contingencies of the other. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing is that given the capacious emic sensibility of this category in Muslim intellectual thought, in addition to the everyday notion of congeniality or good relations between communities, by friendship I also mean registers and arenas like inter-religious translation. So if you have a Muslim scholar translating categories like Dharma Shastra, Karma Shastra and Hinduism and translating them as, you know, Ilmul Fiqh or Ilmul Kalam and so on, what ways does translation become the site of a certain notion of friendship, which also, of course, is Derrida's famous uh, statement that translation is the condition of all hospitality. Uh, or when it comes to political collaboration in re regards to the context of the Khilafat movement. Or when it comes to imitating the customs and habits of the non-Muslim, which is what is uh, relevant in the idea of Tashabbo. So how all these different well, varieties and arenas of friendship become the site for both opposing readings by major Muslim scholars of the tradition and also becomes a site that is constantly in tension and friction with the notion of the sovereignty of the self. That in some ways is some indications of what I'm getting at with the idea of friendship. Hello. Uh, so, um, since there is such a um, generous and large dialogue and discussion on um, the various views that people, scholars have about uh, friendship or uh, relationships with the other, why do we see them disappear uh, close to the moment of partition and why is it that the, the narrative generally becomes very exclusionary and that you don't see, for example, at partition that uh, we can have a nation state which allows for uh, multiple religions to live in this friendship uh, within the new nation state. And why is it that, La for example, the city of Lahore must become an exclusively Muslim space and that the historical Sikh or Hindu community must be asked to leave or forced to leave? Uh, why does that religious narrative then not persist? I mean, that partially has to do with the logic of the nation state. And I don't think that Dr. Therene is arguing that, that all views were generous, even in the colonial age. So, um, I actually, there's a, obviously you um, dedicate your book to a very interesting uh, individual, um, Sharjil Imam. And uh, I'm from Kashmir, we know about him. Um, and, um, He's very important to us as a political actor, but having spent some time uh, in Pakistan, um, Sharjil Imam, uh, barely nobody, um, barely anybody knows him uh, in Pakistan. Now, in Pakistan, one of the things that I have noticed, and this ties to the idea that your book is not just speaking or, you know, looking at history as something that happened in the past, but it's happening in conversation with the present. Now, in Pakistan, there is this um, pervasive proclivity of romanticizing a pre-BJP India. Um, and BJP and Modi's India is seen as a rupture, you know, so everything is going all right and all of a sudden in 2014 something goes, you know, wrong and it's an aberration so to speak. Now, when it comes to Sharjil Imam, he was one of the most uh, prolific critics of this romanticization of pre-BJP India. So, I, I'm aware of the fact that you have talked about this uh, in your different, you know, at different places, but it would be good if you kind of shared some light on this uh, idea as well, both Sharjil Imam and also this line of critique of his. Thank you. I, I think I'll begin with the second question and tie it to the first one. Uh, so Sharjil Imam, of course, for those who may not uh, have heard this name, uh, is this very charismatic and important uh, uh, Muslim activist uh, and, and, and intellectual uh, in his mid-30s by now, I would think, um, who, of course, was the leading force in the 
protests which were led in 2020 against uh, the CEA and uh, NRC uh, moves that were made by the Indian government led by Modi, and who was really one of the key inspirations for the Shaheen Bagh protests. Um, um, as part of which he gave a couple of very interesting but provocative speeches, uh, in one of which uh, he uh, called for a, a chakka jam, meaning a traffic jam uh, coming from Assam, closing all the roads coming from Assam. So he was charged with sedition and still is in the uh, high uh, security and surveilled uh, Tehar prison outside of Delhi to this day in a case which uh, is ongoing and but is uh, known for its deeply Islamophobic character of that case. So, um, in that very speech for which he was charged for sedition, towards the end of that speech, he makes a very interesting set of observations that even if one agrees with or not, I think are important for consideration. In that speech, he talks about a text which I analyze in chapter four of the book on cow sacrifice by Ahmad Raza Khan. It's called The Finest Viewpoint on Cow Sacrifice, Anfusul Fikr Fi Qurban Al Bakr. Um, in which Ahmad Raza Khan basically makes the argument that I talked about as well, that cow sacrifice, although in Islamic law, is not obligatory, but because it is a marker of Muslim distinction in the specific context of colonial India, um, um, withdrawing from this practice or doing away with this practice under the pressure or coercion of Gandhi in the Indian National Congress and the Hindus would in fact be in the shame and humiliation of the Sharia and of Islam and that's something that we cannot al allow. So hence this practice of cow sacrifice is indeed obligatory in this specific context. So Sharji Imam basically talks about this text and talks about its key positions uh, and then says that, you know, why is it that this position is not taught to us Indian Muslims in schools, in textbooks and so on. And why are we only taught the Azadian position of Hindu-Muslim intimacy, friendship, Congress, Khilafat movement, collaboration and so on. Um, and, and he says that, you know, uh, Azad's uh, uh, intention must have been very good, but he makes a very interesting prov provocative statement that again, if you agree with it or not, I think is uh, important to consider. He says that this very collaboration between the Khilafat movement and the Indian National Congress and this whole uh, argument of theirs that you should abstain from cow sacrifice because it would injure Hindu religious sensitivities. Uh, he says that this precisely is what opened the doors for the current Hindu nationalist cow protection movement. Uh, and they might have had good uh, you know, intentions, but this opened the door for making Muslims abstain from their rituals, etc. And the Hindu majority basically has taken over in that manner. So then he says something very interesting, he says that our history has not been written. It will take 50 years to write our history. By which, of course, what he means is that this whole genealogy of Muslim intellectual thought is something which is not considered. Now, how it connects with Ahmed's question here is that what Sharjil Imam was uh, critiquing is a certain kind of a liberal secular narrative that uh, only sees uh, uh, BJP India or Modi's India as some kind of a radical rupture from an otherwise pluralist secular uh, uh, in Nehruvian India and his main point is in fact it is precisely that Nehruvian secularism that might have paved the way for this Hindu majoritarian nationalism that you find here. Now regardless of what you think of his positions I think his whole idea about the lopsidedness of historiography is quite interesting. Um, the reason why I dedicated the book to him is to, to honor his struggle against state violence uh, and uh, state violence which is uh, deeply Islamophobic at the same time, so uh, it was a gesture of some solidarity. And interestingly, the book has reached him in prison. I, I'm in contact by his brother, so he's in fact reading things. And the last thing I heard from his brother from prison was that he was uh, deeply critical of uh, Faisal Devji's forward to my book, and he was raising all these critiques of he's misreading Allahabadi, etc. So that was interesting. Um, uh, I'll have to give it more thought. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I, so the way it connects to the earlier question is that, uh, is that uh, in some ways, as Alia correctly said, that even in the colonial moment, even before 1930s, etc., it's not as if everything was a laboratory of intercommunal harmony supplanted by something else. But I would say that something like the Khilafat movement which is historically sandwiched between 1857 and 1947, does see the articulation of political visions which are not reducible to the modern nation state. Azad or someone like Ahmad Raza Khan. Azad and 
this other guy called Malik Abdul Bari from the Farangi Mahal School, they are uh, locating sovereign power in the institution and the promise of the caliphate. Someone like Ahmad Raza Khan locating it in the distinctive markers of distinction, uh, ritual distinction in the public sphere, like cow sacrifice, etc. Something on which, by the way, he's in complete agreement with his otherwise uh, existential rivals, the, the Dioban school. On this point, they're actually in firm agreement when it comes to Hindu-Muslim friendship. But clearly, we see visions of the political being articulated that are not bound to or reducible to the juggernaut of the modern nation state. And that, I think, is a productive thing to hold on to in regards to this discussion. I've heard your deep analysis with a lot of interest, but when I start thinking about macro, right, I find that there are two things. One is the struggle of the Muslim to keep his identity, right? And on the other hand, how much do you give up your identity to harmonize with everything else which is outside of the Muslim sphere, right? And then I read about Abdullah Yusuf Ali and his translation and the notes and his history, how he was apologetic to the British Queen and continued to reassure them that we were in line with what they wanted us to do. So I, I, I kind of really get confused and the confusion is that you know, we talk about cow slaughter, we talk about, to me, these are only things which are symbolic. These are things which do not address the ability to be secure within our own beliefs and not be concerned about what others think. But it seems that we were always trying to uh, somehow harmonize ourselves with all these different currents that were happening, whether it was Khilafat movement, yes, we wanted the Caliph, but then what was it happening doing to, to India? Like you said, the Muslims and the Hindus were trying to find a common ground. But for what? And I, I kind of keep on asking myself this question. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, uh, your first point is Correct. I think it's all, it is about uh, competing visions of Muslim identity in a world defined by the absence of Muslim political sovereignty. On the on the second point, you know, I, I would just perhaps say that um, the the very ideas of pro-colonial, anti-colonial, etc., I think meant very different things in that context than what they have come to mean today. So when we look back at this debate. I think it would be uh, conceptually problematic to look at someone like Azad as in just these anti-colonial ways, and of course, even more problematic perhaps to look at someone like Ahmad Raza Khan as quote-unquote pro-colonial. These are sort of projections back on this past after partition, where you, you know, have this uh, uh, invested interest in, 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 in drawing up a rostrum, or a roster rather, of the past, where you have either, you know, pro-colonial, anti-colonial, inclusivist, exclusivist, and that I think you see especially in a time period which, of course, Alia specializes in, is the Mughal period, this whole idea of uh, who was the villain, who was uh, the hero between, you know, Akbar and Aurangzeb and, of course, Shah Jahan and so on. And there has been some recent scholarship, an excellent recent scholarship that has tried to trouble these kinds of uh, nationalist projections uh, onto the past. That these very categories of... of, of uh, uh, a thought are in some way so indebted to a certain nationalist framework that perhaps it is not that ad adequate or useful in terms of looking at the past. I really want to thank everyone for their time and especially Alia for your time and reading of the book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tharine. Thank you all of you for being a very engaged audience.